From the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors this program. I'm very pleased to have as our guest for this broadcast former U.S. Congressman Steve Solars. Uh, Steve was a very influential member of Congress, representing, I guess, Brooklyn, New York, and areas thereabouts. Uh, he was a, uh, a Democrat leader on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, now called the International Relations Committee, and uh, he was a very articulate spokesman for the policies he advocated. As you might surmise, Steve and I did not always agree on issues. As a matter of fact, we had some very lively discussions on various uh, television venues uh, back during that period of time. Uh, Steve Solars has remained active in the public policy area. He does a great deal of work of a uh, humanitarian as well as a political nature, and I'm very pleased to have uh, the opportunity to get his perspective on some of the issues uh, with which the President and Congress are dealing today. Steve, one of uh, the areas in, in which uh, you were known uh, to be knowledgeable and expert was with respect to U.S. relations with the government of India. And <clears throat> India doesn't really have a well-defined image in the United States. Uh, I know growing up, I knew all about V.K. Krishna Menon, who never had a good word to say about the U.S. at the U.N., and I knew about uh, uh, Nehru and Indira Gandhi and other members of the Gandhi family. Uh, over time, India seems to have become much friendlier to the United States than it was at one point. Uh, it is one of the largest democracies in the world, and uh, uh, we have tested uh, their friendship by virtue of our very close relationship with the government of Pakistan in connection with the war on terror. What can you tell us about uh, what's happening in India and uh, what the state of play is with respect to U.S.-India relations? The relationship between India and the United States is probably better today than it's been at any time uh, for the last 43 years. Uh, going back to 1962 when China went to war against India and we came to the assistance of India, uh, which generated a lot of uh, support for the United States in New Delhi and elsewhere around the country. But the relationship today is a very strong one. Uh, over a decade ago, uh, when India was on the verge of national bankruptcy, they took a decision to move away from the kind of state-controlled economy which had previously characterized their economic system and uh, eliminated what was known as the license Raj, in which uh, you needed a license or permission from the government to engage in virtually any kind of economic activity. That greatly facilitated an increase in investment and uh, in improvement in trade between our two countries. So, for one thing, we now have a much greater economic stake uh, in India uh, than we did when its economy was much less open and much more closed. Secondly, with the end of the Cold War, uh, the, uh, one of the major obstacles to an improvement of relations between the world's most powerful democracy, the United States, and the world's most populous democracy, India, has uh, been eliminated because during the Cold War, when we were very close to Pakistan, India uh, was very close to the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union no longer exists. And that rivalry between Moscow and Washington uh, no longer has the same character which it did, uh, did then. And then I think also, uh, particularly with uh, the current administration, uh, there is a sense that down the road there is a, a possibility that we might confront uh, an increasingly powerful China should Beijing choose to uh, endeavor to establish uh, a kind of Chinese 
hegemony uh, in the Pacific. And if that were to happen, I think there's a sense on the part of the administration that India might be uh, a natural ally of the United States, a country that would share our interest in preventing a spread of uh, Chinese uh, power uh, in, in Asia. What is the state of India PRC, People's Republic of China, relations today? Is it uh, cooperative? Is it competitive? How would you characterize it? Uh, there are elements of uh, both uh, cooperation and competition in the relationship. Uh, India wants a good relationship with China. Their trade relations have uh, increased exponentially in the last uh, few years. But there are problems. They still have a border dispute, uh, which remains as the residue of the 1962 war between those countries in the Himalayan area. Uh, there have been continuous negotiations uh, between the two countries over how to resolve that border dispute for uh, well over a decade now, but uh, it hasn't produced a, a definitive agreement. And the failure or inability to resolve that uh, problem uh, creates a lingering source of tension. Then, uh, from China's point of view, uh, India has given sanctuary to the Dalai Lama and to many of the Tibetans who fled Tibet uh, after China, uh, in effect, took it over in the uh, late 50s, early 1960s. And the presence of a large Tibetan community and the Dalai Lama in India uh, has been a source of irritation uh, to China. I think it's a credit to India that they've willing, been willing to provide a refuge for these Tibetan exiles, but it is one of the uh, difficulties uh, in the uh, relationship. And, of course, there are memories of the fact that China did go to war against India in 1962. Finally, uh, China has had and continues to have a very close relationship with Pakistan, uh, which has been India's primary rival in the subcontinent. And the Chinese have, among other things, uh, apparently provided nuclear weapon designs to Pakistan, which greatly facilitated Pakistan's acquisition of nuclear weapons. And I think this is uh, a source of very real concern uh, to uh, India. It seems that uh, both uh, the leadership of India and Pakistan have uh, tried to tone down uh, what at one point appeared to be a brink of war situation between the two countries. Um, is there a strong anti-Pakistan feeling emotionally and otherwise among the population of India, or uh, has that calmed down? Most Indians, certainly the Indian government, would very much like to have a uh, peaceful and constructive relationship with Pakistan. But uh, so long as Pakistan continues to provide support uh, for uh, jihadis who were attempting to fight the Indian government in Kashmir and to uh, force India to agree to relinquish its control over Kashmir, uh, there is going to be uh, continuing tension between the two countries. They are now engaged in a dialogue at the highest levels. The two prime ministers have met. Discussions are underway at the foreign secretary level. Uh, they're looking for ways to resolve their differences, uh, not only over Kashmir, but over other issues as well. So there is a desire uh, to avoid another war with Pakistan, uh, but there remains continuing uh, wariness in India over the fact that Pakistan to this day continues to provide assistance in various forms uh, to not only the Kashmiris who were fighting against India and Kashmir, but to a kind of Islamist international, including Afghans and Chechens and, uh, and uh, Bosniaks and uh, others who come from a variety of Muslim countries 
who see this as a, uh, an opportunity and perhaps from their perspective an obligation to resist what they believe is the domination of the Muslim majority in Kashmir by India. Before we go to the break, uh, regarding India-China relations, uh, India is understandably concerned about the growing power and influence of Beijing. What is the state of India's military? Are they building up their military out of this kind of concern? Well, India faces two potential security threats. They face uh, a potential threat from China, with whom uh, they went to war in 1962 when China attacked them. But they also face a potential threat from Pakistan, with whom they fought three wars since independence in 1947. Uh, and which continues to support a insurrection in Indian-controlled uh, Kashmir. I think the Indian military is formidable. Uh, they are a nuclear power. Uh, uh, I don't think they have anything like the kind of military might, for example, the United States do, has. Do they have, but they are the dominant power in South Asia. Do they have the kind of navy which can... Uh, provide an essential defensive role with respect to a possible threat at sea? Uh, I think they have one and possibly two aircraft carriers, uh, <coughs> but the main threats they face are not from the sea but from uh, the land. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to ask uh, Congressman Solars to share with us his views on energy issues. Uh, affecting uh, the United States and Southeastern Asia, as well as some other topics. Please stay with us. One of the top leaders in the Communist Chinese military declared that the United States is the main enemy of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the People's Republic of China, which is longhand for what we call China. Uh, we have been building up uh, our enemy, if that is a reciprocal term, by giving them most favored nation status and membership in the World Trade Organization. Last year alone, that gave them an $84 billion advantage in uh, money which is fungible. And uh, as a result of the extra money they have, they're not only taking jobs from the United States, they're increasing their military budget by 17% a year. It's time to stop sending technology and dollars to communist China. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Face the Truth is a production of the Conservative Caucus and is seen twice monthly on the station you are watching. We will be interviewing the movers and shakers of the pro-life movement. We hope to educate and even inspire you about what is being done in our country to protect and to promote the sanctity of life. Please watch us. Don't miss Face the Truth with Stephen Peruka and Conservative Roundtable with Howard Phillips right here on this station every week. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Help the Arbor Day Foundation plant more trees across the nation. Plant a tree today for all the world to share. Go to arborday.org. Everyone's telling me how I should feel. It's not like I planned to get pregnant. Not now. When I got pregnant and didn't want to be... I was shocked and scared and so lonely. People telling me how to feel, what to do, and not sticking around when it really counts. So now, it's all up to me. But abortion, not me. I'm having a baby, and I can't run away from that. We'll make it. Yeah, we'll make it just fine. 
Come on. You're going to tell me that buying one imported towel is going to cost someone their job? Ever tried shopping for clothes with a four-year-old? I can't be looking for where the stuff is made. Since 1980, nearly half a million Americans who make apparel and home fashions have lost their jobs. Even though the quality of our products is second to none. Which makes you wonder if it's foreign competition that's hurting us. So the shirt's imported. Who's it going to hurt? Or if it's us that's hurting us. Buy American and Americans work. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, and our guest is former Congressman Steve Solars, a leading uh, Democratic Party expert on questions of foreign policy. <clears throat> We've been focusing primarily on areas of, uh, of his particular interest, namely Southeast Asia. And one of the things I, I'd appreciate your take on, and I know that in the private sector you do some work concerning energy, uh, they called it the great game. But what is happening with respect to uh, energy uh, in Asia? China has an ever-expanding need for energy. They're moving all over the world. They just uh, made a deal in Canada, which will give them a big share of Canadian uh, oil. And they're also involved in mining there. They've been working with Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. I have a son who does work in the Sudan. And he sees uh, Chinese military equipment all over the place helping the Khartoum government, and uh, part of it is so they can exploit uh, the oil deposits in southern Sudan. What's happening in Asia uh, regarding the competition for energy in which Russia and China particularly have an interest, as do we? I think the big story, Howard, when it comes to <clears throat> energy in Asia is the extraordinary economic growth which continues to characterize the Chinese economy and which is beginning to characterize the Indian economy. If both those countries continue to show very strong rates of economic growth in the years ahead, uh, they're both going to have enormous and increasing demands for energy. And this is a factor which is likely to uh, keep gasoline prices uh, very high. Especially as the dollar diminishes in value. Uh, well, exactly. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a potential <coughs> problem for the United States. On the other hand, I think uh, the fact that in both these countries where hundreds of millions of people live in absolute poverty, the fact that they have been able to grow economically has had the effect of greatly reducing the number of people who uh, do live in abject poverty. And I think from a humanitarian perspective, that's a very welcome development. Uh, back to trade for a second. Um, has, uh, has India erected any barriers to uh, uh, China's role in the Indian economy? Well, India does have a number of, uh, of uh, barriers to trade, uh, but uh, those barriers have been coming down. The Indian economy has been opening up. Uh, they have a ways to go, but over the last decade there's been very substantial progress in that regard. And the fact that there's been a significant increase in the level of trade between India and China indicates to me that to the extent that there are any remaining barriers to Chinese exports to India, they're probably going down. But India doesn't have the up. kind of trade deficit with China that we have. Uh, no, I don't think so. You're also very interested in Taiwan and what's happening there. And one cannot help but notice the ongoing steady buildup of the Chinese military and uh, the possibility that uh, it could uh, intimidate, if not uh, militarily disrupt, the situation on Taiwan. Do you have any thoughts about how the Taiwan-Beijing uh, relationship uh, will unfold during the years ahead? I think this is a source of very real concern because there has been an ongoing Chinese military buildup, particularly on their side of the Taiwan Straits. Uh, they've now got a few hundred missiles targeted on Taiwan, 
and that number continues to grow. Furthermore, there is uh, increasingly belligerent rhetoric emanating from Beijing. Uh, they are uh, presumably going to enact in the near future what they characterize as an anti-secession law, uh, which has gotten Taiwan very you know, nervous about what this might mean uh, for their future relationship with China. Taiwan, on the other hand, uh, would very much like to resolve its differences with Beijing peacefully. Uh, the president of Taiwan, Chen Sui-bian, has uh, said that he would like to resume the cross-straits dialogue. China has said that uh, the precondition for resuming the cross-straits dialogue is a willingness by Taiwan and its president, Chen Sui-bian, to accept the One China Principle. Chen Sui-bian's response has been that he's perfectly prepared once the dialogue resumes to discuss the One China Principle, but he's not prepared to accept it as a precondition for beginning the negotiations no, in the first the place. Concessions. Now, when Colin Powell uh, visited uh, Beijing and I think Shanghai and Hong Kong in December, uh, he said the United States now embraced the One China policy, which seemed to me to be a move away from the previous position of our government. What is your take on the stance of the Bush administration? Well, actually, uh, ever since the Shanghai communique, which was issued when President Nixon uh, made his... Wasn't it when uh, Reagan? No, when Nixon oh, okay. went in 1972, uh, he and Mao Zedong uh, agreed on the Shanghai communique in which the United States accepted in principle that there was one China and uh, uh, Taiwan was part of uh, China. And that's been uh, American policy ever since then. But what Secretary Powell said on his last trip to Beijing, which was so worrisome, particularly to the people on Taiwan, was his assertion that Taiwan was not a sovereign country. It obviously our, is and, a sovereign And even country. under Nixon and Reagan, uh, and I was in Taipei when Reagan issued his statement, uh, or a statement was issued in his name, that uh, we would diminish the quality and quantity of uh, weapons for sale to Taiwan. But even then, uh, in the context of a so-called uh, One China policy, uh, the principle was that this was a matter to be resolved peacefully yes. with the approval of people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Well, that remains our policy, and we're very much committed to a peaceful resolution. And also, uh, President Bush, to his credit, in my judgment, in his first term, made it very clear, unambiguously, that if China attacked Taiwan, we would come to the defense of Taiwan. Prior to that statement, our policy particularly under uh, both the first President Bush and President Clinton, was characterized as a policy of strategic ambiguity, where we were deliberately unclear about what we would do if uh, China attacked Taiwan. And President Bush, number 43, felt that it was important to be clear here. Unlike Gene Hatchison's statement that Korea was outside our defense perimeter. Yeah. Steve, we're going to have to take another break. We'll be back with former Congressman Stephen Solars right after these messages. Please stay with us. When you see the terrible decline in public morality, do you have a suspicion that something's gone wrong in America? Would you like to make a positive difference for freedom and for liberty? Institute on the Constitution is a historical study designed to teach you about the basic core ideas behind the Constitution. The ideas that built America. Call the number on the screen and learn more. The Institute on the Constitution, 410-768-2280, www.instituteontheconstitution.com. There are many conservative organizations, but the Conservative Caucus is unique in that our standard for evaluating public policy is the Constitution of the United States. Our goal is to advocate policies which conform to what the Constitution stipulates and to oppose those which undermine the Constitution. It's clear that the federal government has only those powers 
which are provided in the Constitution, which were initially delegated by the states to the federal government, or which were subsequently added by amendment. If we adhered to that principle, your taxes would be lower and your liberties would be more secure. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Welcome back. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, I hope you'll check out our website, www.conservativeusa.org, or drop us a line at 450 Maple Avenue East in Vienna, Virginia, 22180. And if you want to be in touch with Congressman Steve Solars, you can reach him at the address which is shown on your screen. Well, Steve, uh, you've done a lot of things that we haven't discussed, and uh, one of the areas in which you've been active is in Kurdistan. I've always had a great uh, deal of sympathy for the Kurdish people. I think uh, they've been very badly treated by the policies of the U.S. government over the years, uh, very unjustly. And uh, I'm glad to know that you're helping them with a hospital in Kurdistan. Tell us what you've seen uh, among the Kurds when you've been there and worked with them. Well, this has been... Uh, the best time for the Kurds. Uh, over the course of the last decade, they've enjoyed more functional autonomy than they've ever had in their history. Uh, they were more or less protected from the depredations of Saddam Hussein by the no-fly zone, which was patrolled and enforced by the United States. The Kurds are, without question, the best friends of America in Iraq today. Uh, like you, I was appalled by the way we treated the Kurds at previous points in our history. And in fact, when I was elected to Congress for the first time in 1974 and came down to Washington in 1975, one of the very first things I did was to visit the legendary Kurdish freedom fighter Mullah Mustafa Barzani, who had been forced to go into yeah. exile after I, we... I think I know him through Bill Sapphire's columns, right. who wrote about this frequently. Right. Well, I, I went to see him in Washington, where he was living, to express my sense of shame as an American over the way in which we had treated him and his people. We're going to have to stop it there, Steve. I'm sorry. We could go on at great length, because there's uh, so much that Steve knows and uh, concerning which we could plumb the depths of his knowledge. Thank you so much, Steve, for joining us in the broadcast, and thank you for watching Conservative Roundtable.